Presentation of Dialogue on Idaho Public Television is made possible through the generous support of the Laura Moore Cunningham Foundation, committed to fulfilling the Moore family's legacy of building the great state of Idaho. Large-scale poultry factory farms may be moving to the Gem State. Are we ready for another mega agricultural industry? Stay tuned. Dialogue is next. Hello, I'm Joan Cartan Hansen. Thank you for joining us here on Idaho Public Television, on the World Wide Web, and on public radio stations. When you think of Idaho agriculture, you probably think of potatoes, not chickens. But after Californians passed a proposition that tightened animal welfare laws, large-scale poultry businesses started looking at the gem state as a place to relocate. Idaho has few, if any, regulations to oversee poultry-confined animal feeding operations, or CAFOs. Several pieces of legislation dealing with poultry regulation died in the 2010 legislative session, so Cache County officials and other county leaders have started creating their own ordinances. But should the state step in and establish a regulatory framework to preserve water and air quality and set animal welfare standards before an industry takes hold? Do we want the jobs that these new plants would bring? Mountain Home State Senator Tim Corder plans to propose new poultry regulations next legislative session. He joins us to talk about that, sir. Thank you. I appreciate you being here. Thank you, Joan. I appreciate it. And also joining the discussion tonight are Matthew Thompson, a waste management engineer with AgTech. Mr. Thompson helped the Cache County Commissioners draft their poultry ordinances. Thank you. Appreciate you joining us. Thank you. Also joining us is Lisa Kaufman, the Idaho State Director for the Humane Society of the United States. Lisa, thank you. Thanks, Joan. And Courtney Washburn, the Community Conservation Director for the Idaho Conservation League. Thank you for being here. Thanks. And of course, we want to hear from you. Give us a call toll free at 1 800 973 9800. Let's kick off the question do we, do we need poultry regulations? Is this, an, is this a problem we need to solve or well, an issue we need to deal with? I, I absolutely believe that it is, Joan. We don't want uh, patchwork regulation. We want it to be consistent across the state. We want it to be fair for producers. We want it to be fair to the, the residents of Idaho. We want them to have the assurance that, that the regulation is keeping the environment safe and keeping the animals safe. And the only way we can do that is to have statewide regulation. You, you twitched a bit when I said that there were few or no regulations for, for, uh, for CAFO, poultry, CAFO kind of thing. What, what's your view? Are there enough regulations already in place? Well, you know, we do have an existing <coughs> regulation that's uh, under the, the House of DEQ, and that's for large-scale uh, okay. poultry farms, but there's, there's no regulation that covers anything under those thresholds. And so what Senator Corder is saying is, or what I agree with Senator Corder is that, you know, having a uniform regulation that covers all those types of facilities would be good for Idaho. For most people, it's uh, it's 200,000 birds. If you have something, a facility that's larger than that, then you ha you fall under the DEQ regulations. And what do those regulations entail? What do you have to do? Well, DEQ will oversee. You have to obtain a permit through the state. Um, they will oversee the the design of the facility, uh, make sure the facility is financially viable, that it will be able to, in case of closure, uh, be able to take care of any uh, waste that's. Uh, residing on the facility and make sure that any nuisance issues are addressed. Is that enough? Well, I would say it's not enough. I would say it's a lot easier for us to implement state, state regulation before the industry comes rather than trying to do it after the industry has established itself in Idaho. And I think it's important to do statewide regulations that go further than what we currently have on the books. The scale that we're talking about is actually to me seems huge. I mean we're talking four million birds, four and a half to eight million birds maybe if enough. Is that how in terms of the industry, how big an operation is this? Well the the four to eight million birds, that would be a broiler mm -hmm. um, type operation and that's a typical plant. Um, there's roughly uh, about ninety to a hundred of those size facilities in the United States alone. Mm -hmm. um, the concentration of those facilities is particularly in the southeast. Uh, right. We just we don't have a presence here in the west, and so all the chicken that we have on our grocery shelf has to be trucked here 
Now these are chickens that you eat as opposed to the layers, right. the, and that's, the hens yeah. that lay eggs. And I should clarify that. A broiler yeah. chicken is any chicken that you eat is a meat chicken. Okay. And regardless of size is generically referred to as a broiler. And so, you know, right now all Idaho and most of the chicken that we get here in the West has to be trucked here from, from the East Coast. Now there are plants in California. There are a few plants in California and uh, in Washington, but uh, those facilities can only meet about 60% of the fresh demand on the West Coast. And so here in Idaho particularly, we've never seen a, fresh, a piece of fresh chicken on, in our grocery shelves. Unless you, unless you get it. Unless you raise it in your backyard. Or, right, or buy it locally from right. a local producer. Part of this came about because California increased its uh, cage standards, the requirements for what, how, <coughs> how you can house animals in these facilities. And obviously that's the Humane Society of the United States took an, uh, a great interest in that. Why did, why did that effort go through in California to push through new tougher standards? Well, the egg-laying hens in California are raised in gestation, ca or excuse me, battery cages. And those are cages about the size of a file drawer cabinet, and there's usually typically between five and eight hens stuck in there. And they have about, probably about two-thirds of sheet of an eight and a half by 11 size piece of paper to move around. And when you cram that many chickens into a cage, you're depriving them of um, any type of natural movements that they would do naturally like dust bathing, um, spreading their wings, just being able to turn around, being able to nest. And so what happens is when you cram them all into that very small area, they start to peck at each other, um, they start to cannibalize, so the producers end up cutting their beaks off, usually with no anesthetic, which causes the hens great distress. And in those overcrowded situations, you get very um, high rates of mortality. Um, and you also just, on an animal welfare standpoint, I don't think most people would like to know that their eggs are coming from those kind of conditions. Would you like to see the similar regulations be put in place in Idaho before large-scale poultry farms or factory farms? If are it's going to be egg-laying um, facilities, yes. Broilers is a little bit different. Those, those chickens are usually um, put in cage-free environments or in large covered areas, but at least they're able to roam around. Um, cage-free egg-laying hens, or excuse me, battery caged hens um, that are egg layers, which are different from your broilers, that's just, it's a whole different deal. So yeah, having egg layers come here to Idaho, I would definitely like to see some regulations in place. So how do you begin to put this, the pieces together? Your first round, what first round of legislation did you propose this last session that didn't got out of the Senate, but most of it didn't, but didn't get out of the House. Well, that, that legislation just uh, modernized the definitions <coughs> of, of both poultry and uh, swine. It, uh, uh, it actually included all poultry, not just chickens as well, that, and that was, that was a significant thing. It, it converted an old uh, uh, definition that was based on animal units actually defined how many how many animals that was so it made it easier to, to read and to understand and then it, it brought uh, it brought three pieces of legislation two that had to do with swine and then the one that had to do with all poultry all together and and would have created those sizes uh, below that extra large so that that all the other sizes would have been regulated as well and and then brought about the the rulemaking would have brought about the rulemaking that would have defined uh, much more uh, about those statutes that we were enacting. An email I received from uh, Joe in uh, Princeton asked, could you define what minimum number of inspections per year or what are you thinking, who carries out the inspections and what are the penalties if something is not up to code? Well, the ISDA was, uh, would have been the agency that would have been in charge of the Idaho State, Department of, Agriculture. Idaho State Department of Agriculture and start in charge of making those I investigations, those examinations, inspections. Uh, and that was new in that regulation as well. We were taking both of those animals out of the DEQ and putting them in the Department of Agriculture. The Department of Agriculture has, has years of experience having to do with uh, animal feeding operations. So they would have been able to effectively uh, promulgate rules that would have defined any other specific areas that needed attention with regards to poultry or swine. So uh, the Department of Ag is the entity that, that I believe ought to be doing this and then we have all of our animal feeding operations under one department rather than trying to uh, 
to manage two separate departments and having two completely different sets of staff to, to do those same tasks. Because currently poultry and swine are under the jurisdiction of the Department of Environmental Quality as opposed to the Department of Agriculture. They would be. Uh, it, the uh, there are no inspections being made because there are no s there are no swine facilities right. that are under permit and and no poultry facilities that are under permit right now so no one's doing those inspections this this will be a, a new task and how serious is the possibility of large scale operations coming to the state well there certainly is the possibility um, producers in order for them to make the investment to relocate here they're going to have they're going to want uh, a confidence level that Idaho wants them, wants them to be here, and that the regulations aren't going to change midstream. You know, it's it's one thing for a producer to design a facility to meet the regulation, but when those regulations change, typically making changes to that facility after the fact can be very expensive and 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 really cost prohibitive. And that's that's what the producers in California are facing right now. Okay, let's get to our first caller, um, Buzz in Meridian. Buzz. Yes. Go ahead. Uh, my question is, what uh, plans would they have to take care of the wastes from these large farms like this? Uh, I know that in, in uh, any time you have large animal farms, whether it's chickens, hogs, or dairy, or beef, you have a problem with the waste, and there needs to be real um, consideration given to taking care of that problem. Well, I, I think Matt's going to be the best qualified to talk about the waste itself and how they deal with it. And I can only tell you from my perspective of, uh, of general agriculture is, is that that's absolutely true. That's one, uh, one of the best arguments for having a statewide uh, system of, of regulatory action is because we understand that each of these separate <coughs> species has its own separate and unique sets of problems and their own separate and unique ways that we need to, to regulate them and enforce them and inspect them. So, so it's very important that we, be, that we be very upfront with this, with the counties and with the state and with the people so that, so that they have the expectation that we are handling each species in a in an appropriate way. And I, what I understand is that the poultry folks have done a remarkable job and that in a lot of these, these new facilities, no waste leaves the building except in a, in a method that's able to be directly applied to the land and Matt can certainly Although address The smell's those. gonna leave the building. Well, most of the, the chicken facilities that we have <coughs> today are dry litter facilities and the Typically, you have odors when you have wet, a wet environment, wet manure, lagoons. Um, those situations breed, uh, yield more odors. When you have a dry litter situation, uh, you just the environment's there to really minimize the odors um, from that product. Now, of course, when you do land apply that, if that is the end use, um, and you get, and it gets wet, <laughs> you know, we get some rain, which does happen once in a while here in Idaho. Um, then you would have some odors from that product if it hasn't worked in the ground. But the one thing I do want to point out is that in the existing rules, uh, these facilities are required to have nutrient management plans. Um, the Department of uh, Agriculture does have rules in place right now for table egg facilities. Uh, they are inspected as part for their grade A uh, egg facilities. Um, but most of the processes that we're evaluating right now for uh, broilers that may come to Idaho is um, pelleting operations and energy, you know, using that litter to, to generate energy. Um, I, I think that land application, the litter has more value um, than just land applying it. Um, and so we don't foresee land application really being the main use of the litter. It certainly could be an option because there's, there's a lot of areas of Idaho that are remote that don't have access to feedlot or dairy manure. And so if a you know, if a chicken facility locates mm -hmm. in one of those areas, land application may be a very uh, a good use of that product. <coughs> but uh, energy uh, as a biomass facility or um, pelleting that and marketing it as an organic fertilizer certainly has a higher use than just direct land app. Let me ask you about the air and water quality. The Cache County, where, the, where some of these farms are, are potentially looking at, already has a problem with nitrate concentrations in its drinking water. In terms of dealing, if you're going to start crafting regulations to deal with that, 
if, you're, if your area is already in problem, why would you allow something else to come in there if it's already in, 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 in if there's already a problem existing? And I think that's precisely where our concern comes from. You know, when the dairy industry came to Idaho, I think ever since then we've been chasing the industry with regulation as opposed to setting the rules beforehand. So in many places in Idaho, there's extensive groundwater contamination. There are issues with flies. There's the odor issue. So that across Idaho, there are folks who can't plan their family barbecues or can't, you know, they don't know if they can have the picnic that they want to have because of the problems we already have. And that's where the base of our concern comes from. So how do you deal with that when you've set in regulation? Well, I think one of the biggest challenge regarding this is with the budget cuts in the Idaho legislature, for the second year in a row, the state has not m monitored water quality, which is of grave concern to us. So I think the uh, monitoring of water quality needs to be reinstated before, you know, Idaho's ready to add more operations that may add to the problem. And that would just be one example. Okay, let's get to, let's see, next caller is Lisa in Boise. Lisa? Yes. Go ahead. Um, I'm not live, am I? Yes, you are. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, I wasn't ready. Well, I'll, I'll just state my case here. If people, people don't need that many grams of protein a day, and in, in the past few months, I, I believe I'm going to go ahead and try to be a vegan. And I think there are a lot of people who are starting to feel that way because of what animals go through. We just find it horrific. And I don't see the sense in having, you know, these atrocious animal farms where they refer to the animals as units anywhere, much less beautiful Idaho. And I'm, I'm very passionate about them not coming here and about people considering not eating meat anymore. It's not that hard. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, let's go to Glenn in Chalice. Glenn. Thanks for taking my call, Joan. Th my question is what the difference would be between hens laying eggs, having cage eggs versus cage-free eggs, and I'm going to... Right when I hit the mute button, I uh, would like the question answered. Okay. The difference between cage, birds kept in cages or versus coops? Yes. Okay. I don't know. Do you feel? Sure. Um, <laughs> well, actually, the end result is the same. You're still getting an egg. There's, unless, I believe, um, if you feed the hens a different type of feed, you're going to get a little bit more, I think, omega in products in, in some eggs rather than others. But you're still getting an egg. It's just the ethical and moral issue of how you want your, your eggs raised. I'm not a vegetarian. I'm not a vegan. I do eat eggs. But after I have seen videos of how those eggs are raised in battery cages, I buy only cage-free now. And that's my choice. Um, there's also a lot of major corporations that have switched to cage-free. Um, egg use only. Walmart carries only cage-free eggs for their private label line. Costco, the cafeterias at IBM, Google, Yahoo. Actually, both the cafeterias in the U.S. Senate and the U.S. House serve only cage-free eggs as well. And there's legislation in California Correct. that would require any egg sold in the state be to be cage-free. Cage -free. Yes. Would that impact the chance of plants deciding it's worth make, moving from California? If, you, if you can, your product can't be sold in one of the largest markets in the world? Well, I mean, absolutely, that's going to have an effect. Um, you know, the California market is a big market. There's a lot of people in California. Um, but the, the answer, the, the, to go along and further answer the caller's question, the, the difference is, you know, one's cage-free, but at the end of the day, it still takes the same amount of feed to get that egg, um, and that chicken's going to produce the same amount of manure. Right. Now, whether that manure now is located inside a barn where we can control the elements, or now it's going to be outside, um, those those are going to be the main differences but but sure that's going to have an impact to producers and i think you know the biggest impact that the producers in california are evaluating right now is they have facilities that they've constructed that were designed for a certain amount of eggs to pay for that facility and now if they have to reduce their 
their chickens by half, remove half the chickens out of those barns to meet those requirements, their ability and capacity to, to meet those debt obligations is greatly impacted. One point I would like to make though, there is a difference between uh, cage-free and free range. Cage-free eggs, or cage-free hens are not kept in cages. They're still in barns, they're still enclosed. So they're not out running around in the pastures having a great time. They're still <laughs> enclosed in a barn, which is where the battery cage hens are enclosed as well. They're just in a small cage. Free range is a little bit different. Those hens are allowed to go outside. They're allowed to scratch in the dirt. Um, you know, they're outside in the sunshine, but cage-free hen laying, or laying, yeah, cage-free um, <laughs> egg layers are usually kept inside. inside. So there's okay. no outside for them. Okay, let's go to Siobhan in Fruitland. Siobhan. Um, yeah, hi there. Hi, uh, go ahead. Uh, yeah, I just, um, I had a, a couple points. Um, you know, the, this most of this conversation is kind of premised on the fact that uh, it sounds like everybody on this panel has kind of agreed that the poultry CAFOs are coming, but I know a lot of people, especially in the Magic Valley, don't want any more CAFOs, period. And I think that economically, environmentally, and from a labor standpoint, um, that actually is sustainable poultry operations make a much better choice than these poultry CAFOs. Um, you know, those areas you guys were talking about, groundwater contamination, they've not only got nitrates out there, they've got antibiotics and hormones from the existing CAFOs in their groundwater that they're drinking every day and bathing in. And these poultry CAFOs would just add to that. And I really don't think that people in the Magic Valley or anywhere else that's already been impacted by CAFOs want any more of these things. Okay, thank you for your call. I appreciate it. Uh, let's go uh, to, let's let me get one more and then we'll get the discussion going again. Um, Andrea in Nampa, Andrea. Hi, Hi. Um, my question is, oh, am I ready? <laughs> I am, go for it. Okay, um, my question is, uh, when I was in high school, we did an essay on proposition four in California where they said that they had to, they banned battery cages and they had to be free range. Um, and there, to my opinion, there was a lot of concerns with wildlife in the area and our population of like private animals that we own, like our pets. Um, if Idaho were to have these same regulations as like the Humane Society and stuff wants, how do you guys feel that would affect Idaho and our wildlife and our animals and our population that we have, you know, like the, um, the diseases and stuff that they can spread? Okay, Andrew, uh, thank you. I appreciate the phone call. No, I understand that there was Proposition 2, what's, what was passed in California. Could you explain what that? Prop 2 um, basically banned gestation crates for veal or for swine, um, um, ca uh, uh, battery cages for hens and then for veal calves. So there's, they weren't going to be going out right. into the environment. The, the battery cage hens are still going to be kept in a building, but they're just going to be allowed to roam around. They're just not going to be in those battery cages. So there's no interaction with wildlife or people's companion animals or actually with the outside at all. So. And then and I'm going to jump back on the point. Is it is it inevitable that these operations are going to come to the state? I think it is. Uh, I, I think they will come. <clears throat> Idaho has, has a lot of uh, of positive attributes. We still have a lot of wide open spaces. We still have a lot of places in Idaho where operations like these could go and they would never be seen by anyone or smelled or heard. Um, and I suspect we could put 10 million chickens easily in southern Idaho and no one would know they were there if it wasn't on TV. And, and so those are operations that w we cannot, Idaho cannot afford to overlook. Uh, we simply don't want to overlook what it's going to take to have them be safe for the environment. <clears throat> we want to use science. We don't want to use the television to, de to decide where we should put these things or what regulations we ought to have. We want to use science to do that, that to dictate not only the care of the animals but the care of the nutrients. I don't think there's any question that in some places we have too many nutrients. And, and that's a result of, of the very thing that we're trying to avoid with poultry. So. That, 
a lot of that occurred because we didn't have the regulation in place first. That counties were forced to come up with regulations. That we had a piecemeal regula regulatory system, and and that we didn't have the expertise to help them make the right decisions. The state has statewide authority and obligation for water quality. Period. Not counties. The state does, and and we do that through memorandums of understanding with the EPA, with the DEQ. But nevertheless, it still falls back to the state to regulate those things to provide the consistency. That's what we want to continue to do. We, we really don't want to use rumor or innuendo to make our decisions. We want it to be factual. We want an open, frank discussion. Uh, and that's why the, when this regulation began, uh, virtually everyone was involved in, in deciding what it was we want to do. Did we all agree? Not necessarily on every point, but certainly we agreed with the, the goal was that we have a statewide mechanism to go forward. We have just a couple of minutes left. I want to give everybody a, a real quick chance to, to pop in on the question. Why should someone who lives in Coeur d'Alene or in Idaho Falls or in Ada County care about poultry large scale regulation? It's not something Obviously, if you're in the in the Magic Valley, you do care a lot because there's a lot of uh, there are a lot of different kind of CAFOs there, and it does impact the quality of their life. But for the rest of the state, they may not be as interested. What? Why should they be? Well, Idaho is is not divided in this regard. You know, we, we like to divide ourselves. Agriculture likes to divide itself. So with the chicken guys, we're going to fight the pig guys. We're going to fight <laughs> the dairy guys, and we shouldn't do that. Nor should Idaho allow itself to be divided. We need a statewide uh, control, we need statewide regulations, and everyone needs to care about the environment in southern Idaho, even if you live in the north, and, and likewise, everyone in the south needs to be concerned about the quality of life in the north. And, and I would say um, people across Idaho do care. I mean, the natural resource uh, benefits in Idaho are the reasons people move here and the reasons people stay here. Mm -hmm. And particularly in the research we've done, water quality ranks as the highest issue of concern across the state. And I think folks across the state understand that this may be the issue in the Magic Valley, but they have issues as well and that the state has a role in overseeing those. And I apologize, we have run out of time, but we'll catch you two on the flip side when we do our Web Extra conversation. And we'll also try and catch the phone calls, the people who are on the phone, we'll try and catch you as well. So, but before we go to that, I would like to thank all of you for being here. Thank Senator, you, I appreciate thank it, you. appreciate all you being thank joining you. us. If you want more information about this, we've got lots more on our website. Go to idahoptv.org, you'll find links and facts in our web only conversation. And we'll see you here next time on Dialogue. Presentation of Dialogue on Idaho Public Television is made possible through the generous support of the Laura Moore Cunningham Foundation, committed to fulfilling the Moore family's legacy of building the great state of Idaho. To order a copy of this program from Idaho Public Television, call our toll-free number or visit us on the World Wide Web.